Good morning. Are we ready? Yes? Okay. Uh, I'm Philip Hunter. Um, I work at a company called Pulse Labs in Seattle, Washington. Uh, thank you uh, to Blendweb Mix uh, for inviting me uh, to come speak to you today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, voice recognition and where things are today with, with that technology and where I think it might be going. Um, I, before Pulse Labs, I spent some time uh, at Amazon working both for Alexa and then also for AWS, the web services uh, part of Amazon. I've also spent time at Microsoft and I actually um, got started in my career uh, in the voice recognition industry about 20 years ago. That's where I learned to become a designer and uh, got my start in, in technology. So a few questions uh, for all of you. How many, raise your hand if you're a, um, if you consider yourself a designer of, of some sort. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you are a developer. Okay, not as many. Raise your hand if you are in marketing or business development. Ah, fair number of you, okay. Um, great, and then uh, a few more questions, I promise not too many. Um, how many of you are uh, from somewhere in France? Okay, most of you, that's what I expected. Um, anyone here from the US? One? <laughs> she came with me. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, and then, uh, is anyone here from uh, my workshop yesterday? I did a workshop in, uh, ah, hello. Um, so, um, we're going to talk about the world of, of voice products. Um, Pulse Labs, um, just a little bit about the company. We do uh, assessment of the user experience of voice applications. So understanding, are they usable? Are they understandable? Uh, do they um, help people accomplish the goals? So very similar to uh, how many of you have done or been part of usability research for mobile applications or websites? Seen, you've seen that. How many of you are familiar with that? You know what I'm talking about when I say usability? Okay, most of you. So some of you didn't raise your hand. So usability is about um, observing people interacting with a piece of software, whether it's a website or a mobile application or some or a tool. Um, and it's about how well, how easily they can understand something, how easily they can accomplish their their goals, um, and and how pleasant it feels for them to interact with the application or not. So that's what we do with voice applications. And um, it's, it, it's very, even though uh, voice technology has been around for quite a while, we are in a new period of time with voice applications where they're being used for new purposes. And so we're still discovering, like the early days of mobile, we're still discovering things that we need to do better um, and to, um, to, I guess, explore different ways of how they might be done. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with a bit of, a, of an exercise. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to say two words in French. I promise you I will not get it right, but hopefully you'll understand. Uh, so raise your hand if you know croque monsieur. <laughs> yes, okay, most of you raised your hand. Okay, good. Uh, raise your hand if you feel like you know how to make croque monsieur. Not the same number of people, good. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to do a little exercise. Um, how many of you have used an Alexa or a Google Home or some other voice recognition application? Okay, how many of you have s uh, seen it in action, watched a video, something like that? Okay, almost everyone. Okay, good. So I want you to do something. Uh, turn to a neighbor uh, and, and, uh, and uh, decide on a pair. So uh, find someone to be a partner. So each of you turn to someone and say, will you be my partner? Everybody. <laughs> two by two. Okay. Uh, almost everyone, everyone have a partner? Okay. So one of you is going to be Alexa. One of you is going to be a real person. Okay, so choose with your partner who's going to be Alexa. Okay, everyone who's Alexa, raise your hand. Okay, 
Well, it's not quite half of the people, but it's close enough. Okay, now if you're the person, I want you in a, in a moment to turn to Alexa and ask a simple question. Alexa, how do I make croque monsieur? <laughs> and Alexa, you have to explain, okay? You ready? Okay, one, two, three. Thirty seconds. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, stop. Uh, so, if you were the person asking Alexa, raise your hand if you feel like you know how to make croque monsieur from Alexa now. Oh, good, 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 good. There's some good Alexas out there. You should, well, Amazon might want to hire you. Um, if you had an interesting experience, uh, something you want to share, I'd like to hear if, if uh, Alexa gave you a surprising answer. Does anyone feel like sharing that? Something happened that you didn't expect? It crashed. It crashed. Alexa crashed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. I haven't heard of Alexa crashing. Uh, did anyone get a list of ingredients? Yes? Okay, that was good. Did anyone get told to go to a, a, a nearby restaurant? <laughs> no? Okay. Yes? Um, did anyone uh, get told to order delivery? No? Okay. Okay. So uh, if you were Alexa, uh, who felt like they had an easy time explaining how to make this? No one? What was difficult? Anyone want to share what was difficult? Yes. I crashed. You crashed. <laughs> this is very unfortunate. Um, did anyone get uh, confused about, should I start with ingredients? Should I just start with a recipe? Uh, if it's a recipe, do I give this, all the steps first? Do I give steps one at a time? It's a challenge, right? It's, it's, it's not easy. So in the US, I, when, I, when I give this talk, I, I, uh, does anyone know peanut butter and jelly sandwich? That's a, a US, not as good as a croque monsieur, but it's a, <laughs> It's, uh, it's a very easy thing, and, and as a, you learn to make it as a child, and, uh, but trying to tell someone how to make it is, is often difficult. One of the big reasons is because it is so easy for us. We know what to do already, but having to explain what to do is a different thing. So we're going to talk about that. So uh, let's jump into this. I'm going to give a, a, bit, a bit of an overview about where speech recognition is today. And so here are some logos from some of the major companies uh, Google, Alexa, Siri, um, a, a company called SoundHound, and then uh, Samsung's Bixby. So this, uh, these are the players today in, in the voice technology. Obviously, maybe not obvious, but Google and Alexa are far and away the biggest, the most well-known. They have the most uh, global presence. Um, and they are, the two of them are in a very uh, big race to, to be the winner. And Alexa is winning right now, but Google has made a lot of gains. Um, they, they each have their core strengths. Uh, Google obviously has um, done so much work in search for the past 20 years that, they, um, that their speech recognition is, is very good at doing those sorts of things. Amazon has a very uh, deep and wide ecosystem around shopping and, and personal services. So their assistant uh, does a lot of things that are tied into that. 
Uh, Siri was very fun and interesting, and I, I've heard it used uh, even here, but it was, it was, it was a leader uh, back in 2011 when it came out. Um, they haven't done as much um, lately, but I do think that they have some, um, some news for us probably to share soon. And then the other two, eh, we'll see. Um, but uh, as you're, if you are exploring the world of voice, these are the names you should be familiar with. If you want to learn technologies, I would certainly recommend to start with uh, Google and Amazon to figure out how you might uh, get into that. And what is it that we're talking about when you're getting into something? So I, I've been doing speech recognition, like I said, since uh, the late 1990s. I, starting two or three years ago, after Alexa had been out for a short while, I began to see that uh, we are on the next major change in how humans use technology. Um, how many of you don't have a smartphone in your pocket or backpack or um, bag? One person. Okay, that's what I, I, sometimes I'm surprised to get one, sometimes I get a couple. But how, if I asked this question 10 years ago, how many of you were carrying a cell phone all the our mobile phone all the time 10 years ago? Okay, just uh, a, a relative few number of people. I was too. But um, the, the mobile phone, especially the iPhone, has changed how we interact with technology. Would you agree? Yes? So uh, I believe the same thing is happening with voice. Um, it's harder, and we'll talk about why. It's going to take longer than mobile. Um, I think, but um, it's, it's, it's very different uh, than anything else that we've done. So it's going to be a similar change to the web and to how mobile helped us. A couple of things that you want to know about there. It's, it will be common. In other words, um, I expect that we will interact with it in more places than just on the devices we carry or the devices we have in our homes. So I, I believe that we'll see it in public um, or in office settings and things like that. It's also very intimate. When we speak to someone, it's a very personal interaction, even if we don't know that person. And then, when, and, and, and just like mobile phones, devices that we bring into our homes are also intimate. We think of them as, as ours. Even, and I've even been to people's homes where they think of the Alexa device as their Alexa, and they don't want someone else to talk about it. Similarly, right, how many of you regularly hand your phone to a stranger for them to use? Anyone? No, not me. One? One person? <laughs> we had generous. Um, the, uh, but most of us are very attached to this as a very intimate personal object. And so we, uh, I think we will see similar things around how we use voice. Um, and then modes start to become more interesting and, and more diverse. So there's voice only. There's, there's voice in and out. Um, there's uh, voice and uh, screen, and then there's devices that, that do things, lights that turn on or music that plays in places. Um, intermodal and cross-modal, I can tell this Alexa device to play music on that Alexa device, and, uh, or I can tell this Alexa device to show me something on that TV screen. And so these are, um, this, this sort of different controls start to become really interesting. You can do some of that on your mobile phone, but it feels a little bit more magical when you're doing it with your voice. And then lastly, uh, we talk about conversational interfaces, but a lot of times we're really just talking about very basic conversations. The human conversation can be extremely complex and extremely wide ranging. Um, the assistants are not ready for that yet. They're not ready to hear about how uh, well or poorly our day went or how our love life is or isn't and things like that. They can't, they can't do that quite yet. Um, so speaking of the assistants, a little bit about how they work. So just very, very simply, um, you can think of it as the device is a gateway to the cloud. So the device, you, you wake the device up by saying a, a word like Alexa or hey Google and you could say, what's the weather? That Alexa is captured here, but the rest of it is sent to the cloud to be processed. And that uh, cloud then uh, takes that audio, um, digitizes it, turns it into raw recognition results, just a clump of words, um, and then does a text analysis on that to understand what the words are 
and then processes it for natural language uh, um, understanding. So, so something like what's the weather becomes in interpreted as please respond with a, a status of the weather, basically. So we think of this is a very easy statement for us, what's the weather? But for natural language, it has to be processed quite a bit to turn it into something useful. Then the information is collected, it's bundled up, it's sent back to the device in the form of text-to-speech, and then we hear it from the device. And so, and all of that happens magically in, in just a few hundred milliseconds. And so it's, it's quite impressive, and there's, uh, and. It's only because of other technological advances that this works. Um, things like um, high-speed internet bandwidth, um, the ability to have natural interaction processing, natural language processing, um, the idea that there are very narrow contexts in which we use these things. So um, Alexa comes uh, out of the box with weather and movies and traffic and, and things that are very basic. Um, and then um, the idea that machine, machine learning is, uh, is a, a very powerful, very viable technology now. Without that, and especially the machine learning and the bandwidth, it just wouldn't be possible. So when we say possible, what are we talking about? So these are the kinds of things that people are using uh, Google and Alexa for today. They use it to listen to music. That's the, by far and away, by hours, the, the largest amount of activity, or the biggest activity. Uh, the interaction there is very small. Play music, the music plays, I leave it on for three hours. Um, so uh, some of these others have a lot more interaction to them, but the time period that they're interacting with is, is a lot shorter. But you can stay up to date, you can get news, you can do some amount of cooking. It's not too easy, as you just uh, learned. Um, shopping, playing games, um, finding out your schedule for the day, things like that. This is, these are the things that people use. And, and a lot of people love their Alexa devices and, and Google devices. Alexa routinely has to turn down marriage proposals. Um, she is asked to be a, a best friend sometimes. She has to say, well, you can tell me some things, don't tell me other things. Um, so people treat Alexa, treat Google uh, Home as, as a member of their household in, in some ways. Um, and, and that goes back to the, pardon me. Sorry. Um, that goes back to the idea of the intimate technology, things we invite into our home. Now, it doesn't always go well. Here's a poor gentleman who just could not get Alexa to understand. After several tries, he just laid his head down over the fireplace and tried not to say bad words. Um, so it's not, it doesn't always go well. And a lot of that is because people, um, the, the, peop the creators, which would be us in, the, in this room, people like us in this room, don't take the time necessary to make these voice applications as good as they can be. We are limited by the technology, uh, the level of technology, but there are still many, many things that we can do as designers, as, as developers, as business people to make this a lot better. So we'll talk about some of those opportunities. So first of all, just understanding what makes a good product. Now, if you're in, if you've been in software or any sort of product uh, field for a while, these uh, attributes or characteristics of a good product should seem familiar. It, people should know what it's going to do, clarity of purpose. Um, it should have a non-trivial, uncommon benefit. In other words, something, a good product is something that maybe you can't get somewhere else. Um, all of us have favorite products, and, and we feel that you know, the, the thing we have is the only way we get what we want. Uh, it should be comfortable. It should, be, it should feel good to use it, right? It shouldn't, um, you know, setting aside some products like exercise equipment or something, but it should, just, it should feel good. It shouldn't frustrate us. Um, consequential content. It should have something that means something to us. Um, and, and then engaging emotion and gratification. So the idea that um, it, it feels, to use it feels in such a way that you want to come back to it and that you're always glad that you've used it. Um, and so those sorts of things are things that we should aim for in all products and definitely uh, also keep those in mind for good voice applications. A couple of other 
things to add for voice applications. The first one potentially is the most important here is why should I do something with a voice application instead of just doing it with a mobile app or online? And there are many reasons for that, um, but, they, uh, but those things have to be sought after very, in, uh, very particularly. Um, and so the idea is that um, you want to say, if, if, I'm going, if someone is going to do it in voice, they should have a reason to do that. It should be a better way to do it. It, sh it could be a faster way could be more enjoyable. So um, in Seattle, um, I ride the bus a lot to go to work. And when I first started riding the bus several years ago, there was a mobile application called One Bus Away that would tell me when my bus was going to arrive. So I knew how much, or knew when I needed to walk out the door to be at the bus stop to, uh, to meet the bus. And the mobile app was fine. Uh, every morning though, this was my routine. I would find my phone somewhere, I would open it, navigate to the app, open the app, um, navigate to the right screen, see the list of buses, and then uh, figure out, oh, what time is it? And then, okay, I need to leave in about five minutes. So that would take me maybe one minute, not very long, but I would have to, but I would usually, I'm, I'm walking around, I find my phone, and I stop. So whatever I'm doing in the morning, I, I interrupt it to do this, and then I put my phone down and continue on. Well, then the same uh, people who built the app, mobile app, built a, an Alexa skill. And all of a sudden, I could be walking around, and I could say, Alexa, when's the next bus? Well, I'm putting my shirt on. The, uh, the E-line leaves in five minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 13 minutes. And I didn't have to stop. And in about 10 seconds, I got the information I, I needed. I didn't have to touch my phone. I didn't have to unlock any screens or find the app or anything else. Now, it went from, it sounds very small, one, one minute to 10 seconds, but it made an enormous difference in my morning because I didn't have to stop. I didn't have to interrupt. And that is a, that's an example of a very good use case for voice where I can say one thing to Alexa very quickly and I get the information back that I need. So that's the kind of thing that you want to look for. Um, and again, faster, easier, more enjoyable. Um, and this, these three things are sort of a, uh, it's, this is just really about innovation, period. For something, if, for people to adopt something new, they typically need to see the value of adopting it. And, and these three things go a long way, especially if you can do all three of them together. The, the Alexa skill that I started using wasn't particularly great, but it was quite a bit faster and quite a bit easier than the previous way that I was doing things. So here's a couple of examples of uh, skills and Google Actions that I think are really good, and we'll, I'll let you listen to a couple of them in a, in a moment. Um, yesterday when I asked, not too many people knew the game show Jeopardy. It's an American game show, it's a quiz show, uh, and the um, idea of it is that you see an answer and then you have to ask the question that you see the answer for. So it might be something, something like, um, this animal has four legs and goes meow, and you have to say, what is a cat? So if you, don't say, if you just say cat, then it's, you don't get the answer right. You have to say, what is a cat? So Jeopardy is a very popular game show, um, and, um, and, and, and it's a very popular skill. So when the show ends on the television uh, is the highest time that people play the skill. And, so, and it's, it's one of the first big hits on Alexa. Um, and we'll, I'll let you listen to it. And, you, and the, the idea, the, the, the game is very verbal, and so you can say the answer, the question to Alexa, and she tells you if you're right or wrong. Um, so it's very much like playing the game. And Jeopardy, uh, Sony, who created Jeopardy, was very excited about this because the, it was the first time they could simulate actual gameplay. Uh, a couple of other interesting ones. Black History Facts is really, like, so there's a lot of trivia skills. This one is particularly interesting to a lot of uh, people in America because it's about uh, American history from an African-American point of view. 
And then there's a, things like the Magic Door here that are uh, adventure games. Uh, so it's all about storytelling and, and uh, taking you on a, a choose your own path kind of adventure. So let's listen to uh, a couple of these so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about here. I had signal earlier. We'll see if it uh, cooperates. OK. Open Jeopardy. This is Jeopardy. Thanks, Johnny, and welcome, players. Be sure to stay tuned after today's six clues for a special announcement. Today's first category is celebrating share. Cher won a Best Actress Oscar for this 1987 film. Anybody know? Please respond in the form of a question starting with phrases like, who is, or what is. I don't know. The correct response was, what is Moonstruck? The next category is, Globetrotten. Queensland and New South Wales are two of the six states in this country. What is Australia? Yes, that's it. <laughs> Alexa, stop. So that's Jeopardy. Exit. Open the magic door. Welcome back to the Dark Forest Adventure. If you are interested in new stories, ask me about notifications. Oh my, do you feel that cold wind? It sure is getting dark. I don't like that. Let's walk faster. Exit. So there's a couple of examples of, of how people do skills in very different ways. Jeopardy has been very successful. The Magic Door is also very successful. Um, and as you can hear, the approaches are different. So with Jeopardy, there's, uh, there's branding. There's the announcer's voice. The, the host, uh, Alex Trebek, you can hear his voice. Alexa handles the gameplay because it's very dynamic. There's fresh content every day, so they can't have the, um, the host record all of those questions all the time. And then the Magic Door uses a lot of sound effects. It uses pre-recorded audio. The, the uh, creator of the skill is the first voice you hear. It's someone uh, we know, uh, a guy named, uh, what is his name again? Andy. Andy, Andy yes. And so um, the... Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that people do these things. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of different pe reasons people would interact with those. Um, so let's look a little bit at why Jeopardy is successful. So I, I said it's similar to the TV. The voice interaction is, is identical. The answers are also taken from leftovers from today's, the, the day's show. So every day, the content has to do directly with the show that someone just watched on TV. It's very competitive. Uh, you can play against other people that you know. Um, some people, we heard about people coming uh, together to have Jeopardy parties. So they get together and they, they test themselves. You can play old games as well as the new games. Um, and of course, it makes you feel smarter if you get their answers right. So, uh, so that's a benefit there. Um, so what's, if you're looking to get into voice uh, recognition, what are some of the opportunities? So right now, some of the easier opportunities are exchanging information. So um, whether it's um, finding out what the weather is or finding out uh, facts, or uh, sometimes I use it for um, uh, measurements and, and uh, things like that. Um, that's one way. Doing simple transactions, you can order a book, order a movie, um, things like that on, on uh, Alexa and Google. And then amusement and time filling. I can, play a game, I can hear an adventure story, things like that. Um, and some things are interactive, um, like the, the, both of those things that I just showed you are very interactive, and then some are not. So um, 
I, I use my Alexa devices for controlling my lights and things like that, and I just issue a simple command, the lights turn on or off, and I'm done. I don't have to have a lot of back and forth uh, with Alexa about that. So these are some of the things that you can do uh, today. Some of the things that are harder have to do with more uh, like detailed explanations, and so you experience that already with recipes. Recipes are very, uh, there's a lot of interest in cooking uh, with Alexa and Google Home, but there's a lot of room for improvement there, and you, think you, you experience some of, of, of why that is. So are you, you know, if, you, if, if you're handling cooking, you have to handle things that are step by step, and sometimes there's preparation time, and sometimes there's cooking time, then do you have all the ingredients, and so on and so forth. Um, things with complex meaning are also tend to be uh, much more difficult. And uh, one of the reasons, the next two, uh, subtlety and sophistication. So Alexa is, a, is more like a smart four-year-old than uh, a smart adult. And so there's, there's you know, four-year-olds make silly jokes. Alexa makes a lot of silly jokes. Um, four-year-olds don't really understand deeper concepts. Alexa doesn't understand deeper concepts. But Alexa can help you with a lot of things. Uh, and then conceptual conversation, um, just handling things about uh, life or um, like uh, time concepts is, is, is very difficult for artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're just not there yet. It doesn't mean that you can't explore some of these things today, but they, they are more challenging than, than the previous slide. Let's look a little bit more about why. So six uh, simple words, I really need to see you. And in the US, this is a, a phrase that um, often means uh, there's some amount of urgency in the two of us meeting together. Now, if I get that in a uh, text message with uh, an emoji that looks like that from someone that I care about, I might be happy that uh, maybe the evening will be very pleasant. Um, and so I really need to see you. I, I get a feeling of excitement, and I'm, I'm glad that I got that text message. If I get this in an email from my boss, did I do something wrong? Am I about to get fired? Did I make someone angry? Or am I about to get an assignment that I don't like very much? Uh, I don't know, I'm not too excited about this. If I get this in a voicemail from my doctor, maybe my life is about to change in a way that I don't want it to. And so you can, you know, the same six words and the context completely changes the meaning across these. And this is part of what the difficulty is with, with speech recognition. And so when we design, we have to design for the context that it's going to be used in. And all, all, those of you who are designers know this already. It's something that we care about both for web and mobile. Um, but the, the context is more sensitive now with voice because we often don't have a screen and we're often in contexts that um, that are harder to anticipate than when someone might be using the web or, or mobile. Um, and the way things are delivered it matters too. You know, and, and again, going back to um, trying to make a croque monsieur, it's, it's the idea that um, not everyone is ready to do all the same things at the same time. And voice is a very immediate um, uh, medium. In other words, we, we, when we're using voice, we're more likely to want to make decisions faster or take action faster than we would if we uh, are looking at something on a screen and we feel like we have a little bit of time to process it. So delivery really matters. Um, and then uh, things like naturalness, familiarity, predictability. M um, many of us don't like to have conversations or take a course of action where we can't guess at what's about to happen. Now sometimes we choose to do that, we might choose to do something that's unfamiliar or adventurous, but most of the time we want familiarity, we want predictability. And naturalness really comes into play in aiding our understanding. Um, the more unnatural something feels, we, so for example, you, 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 the difference between walking into a place of business like a bank or having a conversation with a friend, uh, the bank is going to be more formal, you probably won't talk about your relationships or what you had for breakfast or something like that. Um, but if the person started acting like your best friend, 
Hey, do you want to give me some money today? Great. I want to go put it in the bank. Be like, this is not this is not the natural interaction for a bank. Um, so you have to pay attention to what is going to feel natural around the uh, design that you want. And then handling distraction and memory. When we are uh, when we are speaking, uh, we're very most of us are very visual people, so we can get easily distracted by something that's going on in our surroundings visually. So understanding that that's happening with voice means designing for things to, to help people keep focus and to help people even remember things that, that might have happened during the course of interaction. Another big element here is that verbal interaction is a very different thing from uh, written interaction and screen interaction. So we, we process verbal um, things we hear and even things we're going to say, we process those much more quickly and in a much looser framework than we do when we read something or when we're looking at a screen. It's very important to learn what it is about conversation that is, that is different. And some of that is handling shorter pieces of information. Or, and, and, and then another big part of that is repair and recovery. Um, if, you, if, I, if I could tell you to, to start to notice one thing with conversations that you have, notice how many times you are fixing the conversation. You say things like, I didn't understand that word, or what does that mean? Or, wait, let me get this right. Or, I'm sorry I didn't hear you. All of these things happen very, very frequently in, in our conversation with each other. And, but our voice recognition applications aren't very good at that yet, and, they, and that's a source of a lot of frustration. Um, we can even you know, move f backwards and forwards. What was that point you made a few minutes ago, the thing about um, traveling in Lyon? What, oh, yeah, yeah, and then you can go back to where you were. Okay, great, let's, let's pick back up where we were. Um, sometimes you'll hear conversational interfaces is called uh, zero UI. I don't believe that. Language itself is an interface. It's how we communicate to each other. I translate my thoughts and feelings into a set of words. You hear them, you interpret that, and then you give the same back to me. So this is very much an interface, um, and so it's not zero just because it's invisible. You have to do the work to craft it. And then there's a lot, uh, whoops, a lot of, um, it, it, what we're after is meaning. What we're after is, is saying, how do we, whatever the words are that we're using, and the words are important, of course, ultimately what we're after is a set of meaning. Um, uh, so we want to feel good about the information, or we want to understand something. And so it's, the goal is often to, to reach that meaning and not just simply exchange words. Uh, a few more things things that are very interesting about uh, speech uh, design, the customer, the, the user is in charge. They start the interactions. They guide the interactions. So we're often used to designing an interface that is the, f is the thing that starts the interaction. You land on your mobile app page or you land on, someone lands on your website. Here, Alexa and Google just stay quiet until you want to do something. And you tell them what you want to do, and then they respond to that. So it's a, sort of a little bit of a flip. Um, and then one thought at a time. Like I said, small things. It's very easy for us to process. Um, so we used to talk, in, when I started my um, career, we used to say things like, well, now people can make uh, really easy travel reservations and say something like, I want to fly from Seattle to Orlando on Friday at 2 p.m. in first class. Well, it turns out nobody talks that way anyway. So uh, trying to build a system that would handle that is actually a waste of time. We tend to, to break it down into pieces even when we're talking to each other. Hey, I need, to, I need to book a flight. Okay, where are you going? Orlando. And you're going to leave from Seattle? Yes. When do you want to leave? Next Wednesday. Okay, what time of day is good for that? Good for you. 2 p.m., mid-afternoon. Great, let me look up some flights for you. Even with a person, we tend to do those sorts of things. And I've tried with other people to say things like, I want to fly from Seattle to Orlando next Wednesday at 2 p.m. And they're like, okay, where are you leaving from? <laughs> so where do you want to go? So we aren't really good at handling all of those sorts of things. Time is a big factor here, too, as well as emotion. Just the idea that... 
Um, we're very, you know, as soon as I say something and you hear it, actually as soon as it leaves my mouth, it's over, right? You hear it milliseconds later after I'm saying it. It almost sounds like the same time. It's milliseconds, but then as soon as you're done hearing, it's gone. It's gone forever, unless I say it again, unless I say it again, unless I say, no, it's kidding. Um, so the idea is that everything, you have to be aware that time is passing sort of very quickly when we're having a conversation. And so helping make sure that people feel like the pace works for them and that their understanding is really important. And then language is laden with emotion. We just, we, we're, we're processing things as much with emotionally as, as we are mentally when, when we are hearing things. And it's very important to keep that in mind. So here are some hot tips uh, around uh, possibly designing for voice. So brevity, keeping things short, not abnormally short, but understanding that if you're going to uh, start a voice application, it doesn't really work for people to start it with so imagine we were doing this with Jeopardy. Hello, and welcome to Jeopardy. Jeopardy is a game show where I give you an answer, and you, you tell me the question that corresponds to it. Be sure to tell me that question. By the way, the question has to start with a word like what, or when, or where. Um, I don't accept any other answers. We'll start the game in a moment, but a few other rules, and then a word from our sponsor. Where? No, I don't want to play that anymore. You know, it's, it's, it, so brevity, keep, keep people engaged, get them engaged. One of the pieces, or some of the research shows that the faster someone, the person gets, actually gets to say something, no matter what happens after that, the higher the success rate of the skill. So getting, getting someone to the point that they can say something where they feel engaged, they feel in charge is, is really key. Variety, and just enough of it. People don't like to hear the same thing over and over again. It gets boring. So giving some amount of variety in your wording or how you say things uh, is, is really key to keeping them engaged. And then content as well. So like, like I said with Jeopardy, the, uh, the content is refreshed on a daily basis. Friendliness can be really important. You want it to feel comfortable, but you don't want it to be cute. Think about my bank example. If you walked into the bank, and you, you know, someone says, good morning, how can I help you? You expect that. If someone says, hey, so nice to see you. Do you have some money? You know, you're like, you know, chill. So, um, and, and, and that, that level of friendliness can help with focus too. You, someone is coming to your voice application to do something. It might be to be just to have fun, but they are coming to do something. Help them focus, find out what they wanna do, help them work towards that quickly, which brings me to speed. The quickest path to done is usually better. Now, not, not in a way that makes people feel rushed or makes people feel like um, that it's a, a robot or, they, or that they are in, not in control, but they don't want to feel like their time is getting wasted. They want to feel like they're, they're interacting with something and it gets them, it's getting them to the right place at the, in the, at the right speed. And then ease, and this is, this is one that I see over and over again. The machine should be doing the work. Uh, another way I say it is um, don't make people do math. Um, it, it, there's a lot of times where we ask the, the, the user to do a task that actually the machine can take care of. So, and this really spans many, many types of applications. But in voice, it's even more um, important because the person is typically standing there near a device just speaking. They're not, they don't have an, a UI in front of them, they don't have other, they're not thinking about other tools, and asking them to do something that requires uh, some serious mental processing uh, will probably derail the whole interaction. And this brings me to just being human. Um, uh, just to highlight a couple of different things, these are tools that you can use across, again, any sort of application. We love story, so take me on a journey. It doesn't have to be a flowery journey with lots of adjectives, but help me know how I'm starting and what's in the middle and how I reach the destination or the goal that I have, and then how do I finish nicely. Um, help me with life, you know, using life lessons. We, we love to have things reinforced like um, balance or um, using time well or focus. Empathy and humility. Um, this is the, the sensitivity that many designers bring to the craft of 
understanding what context someone is in and that the, the machine is there to help them, not the other, other way around. Uh, I talked about the feeling of language previously. Iterating toward resolution. I want to sense that I am making progress. It may take multiple steps to do that, but help me understand that I'm getting there. And then intersection and balance. As a person, I bring a lot of things in life to this, um, to, to whatever I'm doing. Maybe I need to, I want to use some of that, um, but I don't, but I also want to find places where, um, so, so that's intersection, is bringing multiple things together. Uh, balance is about just making sure that it's the right amount of things. I don't need to talk about everything, but I might very well need to talk about things or bring into the application some things that you haven't, that maybe you don't think are part of the application, but I do. Um, okay, so. Um, I'll give you some examples here of things that you can use as you're designing. Um, I'll, we'll share these slides. Um, I won't go through all of these uh, items, but when you're thinking of different kinds of speech applications, transactional, informational, there are things that you can have in mind that are points of view that your customer, your user might have. So questions that they might have in their mind. They may not have them consciously, but those are, these are questions that they will feel are important to be answered. And you should, you can use these questions to evaluate your design, evaluate your product choices or, uh, using speech recognition applications. Here's a couple for um, entertainment, education, um, also just you know si similar questions, but more focused on that particular domain. There are also a lot of uh, principles that you can use to evaluate your uh, design choices. So what's in it for me is uh, a, a, something that I use a lot. The what's in it for me is the attitude that the customer is bringing to your application. It's like, what am I getting out of this? How does it benefit me? How is it good for me? Um, useful, usable, desirable. If you're a designer, you've probably heard that phrase before. That's a, a great one. Um, we've talked about freshness of content, engaging. Uh, Grice is, uh, was a, um, uh, did, uh, was a person who did conversational analysis. Um, he's got four maxims, four truths <coughs> about uh, effective conversation. I, I'll have a link to this, but it's around relevancy, honesty, um, things like that, that make for a useful conversation. And then conversational um, parts, aesthetics, rhythm, melody, chunks or bits of information, all of these things are really important to learn as you're, as you're using uh, or beginning to design for speech. So we've talked about all of these uh, for a product. Um, it's a lot of work, but creating a voice app is not, is not, it's relatively easy from a technical standpoint. Creating a great voice app product takes a lot of work like any great product. And these are a great set of characteristics to aim for when you're delivering uh, those products. So if you're thinking about voice, and I encourage you all to, even if you, um, even if you think it could only be a part, there's all, all, actually a lot of benefit that I've gotten from being a voice designer when I've designed other things as well. I've designed developer tools, I've designed for the web and mobile, and understanding conversation and how people think when they're conversing has actually helped me quite a bit. So if you, if you love things that challenge your thinking, um, if you believe that real innovation is about providing benefit, not just building things because you can, and if language is somewhat of, a, of a, an obsession of how people talk and how people use words, then voice design could be something that uh, you would enjoy quite a bit, either as a full-time career or as uh, something to add to your toolkit. Um, I've got a list of resources in here. I won't go through them all. Um, Said I'll stop here and say thank you, and then I think we have a few minutes for questions if you uh, if you would like. So, any questions? Yes, up here in the front. I think we have a microphone coming around. Is it my mic that comes around? Okay, then I'll stand here. Okay. Uh, I have a question about uh, the assistant you, you spoke about, for example, Alexa, Siri, and uh, Google. Uh, why can't we ch change their name? Uh, because Alexa is a common name. Siri, in French, is the place where we cut woods, and uh, Google is a, an insult for 
disabled people. But, uh, so can we change their name? I know that Siri can change our name. Uh, for example, now Siri called me Donking. I don't know why, but uh, I think it was a misunderstood. <laughs> now I get email from Apple. They call me like that. Okay. okay. Uh, so when uh, will be will we be able to change our assistant name? So Alexa allows you to pick from four names right now. So you can pick Alexa, Amazon, Computer, or Echo. Um, I. And so, and, and precisely because some people don't like using uh, something that sounds like a person's name, some people like the series Star Trek, so they say they like to say computer, which is something from that uh, TV show. Um, Google, I think you have a fewer choices, and I haven't heard of anything about how to change Siri's name. Uh, I suspect, though, that that will come fairly soon. Uh, I know when I was at uh, Amazon, that was discussed a lot about how letting people choose their own name uh, to say. So if you wanted to call it um, uh, apple pie, you could call it apple pie. <laughs> What's that? Jarvis. Jarvis, yes, that's right, right. Um, so I, probably in the next year or so, I, I, would, I would predict. More questions? Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I'm sure uh, you, uh, you have heard of Google Assistant, mm -hmm. the, the brand new duplex thing. Yes. Um, and uh, I was curious about what do you think are the, the next challenges in terms of interactions that it poses with humans? Because when you get a phone call and you don't really know that it's a machine you're speaking to, mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of, um, on a design point of view, what, what kind of, uh, Things, what are the things you can do in order to prevent people from being uh, misleaded? Yes, a very good question. And so the idea is, the, the, the challenge there is, is it ever appropriate for a machine to not be known to a human as a machine? Should the machine always say? And I, I, I think that, that, uh, that a right now, if a person is interacting with a machine, they should always know. And, and there's several different reasons for that. One of them is simply just how trust is built between two people even. If I, you know, you and I don't know each other, I am unlikely to start a conversation about my personal finances or about my struggles with, you know, personal relationships with you because I don't know you and I don't trust you and I don't know yet. I mean, it's not that I, it's not that I actively distrust you like I think you might do me harm. It's just that I, I don't, I, we haven't demonstrated to each other how well we can trust each other. And so that's a big part of this with, with machines. And of course, we see this with uh, apps that we're using, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. How much do these things know about us? What are they, are they recording things? Are they, and, and it turns out that in some cases, they're not doing the right thing. They're, do, they're capturing information about us when, when we don't know. And then they're using it in ways that we know nothing about. And so I think similarly, if you're interacting with a machine, right now the best course of action is to let someone know. Now, the naturalness of Google Duplex is astounding. And, and I, w I was at the Google I.O. conference when they announced it, and I was, I was seriously shocked. And, um, and, and so from a, from a certain, you know, I love technology, I love voice technology, it's really exciting, but I do worry about its misuse. Um, and then, when you, especially when you bundle in other things like the ability to simulate voices of real people and things like that. So I think as technologists, we have to be um, active about making sure that um, the people who are interacting with our, our products understand uh, as best they can what they're interacting with. 